Are all of you this morning? Yes. <laughs> right, we're going to continue to look at Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. Continue to look at Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we've moved on from the change of mind to the change of life. Because that's what happens. When Jesus changes your mind, guess what? He changes your life. So we're going to continue to, to look at Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at Ephesians 4, 25 through 27. I had put out that we're going to go through 32, but you know what? I can't go that far. There's too much good stuff in, in these three verses right here. Uh, before we begin, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, I just want to thank you. Lord, I just want to praise you for the wonderful day that you've given to us, Lord. Lord, just thank you for the things that you have showed us. Thank you for the things that you reveal to us each and every day. Lord, I just want to thank you for the time that we're able to spend with your church, with your family. And Lord, I just thank you so much for letting us be able to come together and to be able to worship in song, to be able to worship in your word, to be able to worship in all that is going on here at Red Springs. Lord, I pray that we are able to do that each and every day. And Lord, I just pray right now for those who aren't with us this morning, those who are sick, those who are, who are working, those who just are here, Lord. Lord, I just pray that you just continue to be with them. Lord, just show yourself to them. Lord, just reveal yourself. And Lord, I pray for those who are sick this morning in our congregation. Lord, just be with them. Lord, just watch over them. Lord, I just pray that you just help them to be able to, to be healed in whatever capacity that is, in whatever way, Lord. Lord, just be with them and watch over them. Lord, just be with those who are taking care of them. Just give them the strength and endurance that they need also. Lord, I just pray right now that you will reveal yourself to us, Lord, through your word. Lord, help us to know you. Help us to know more about you. Help us to know more about who we are in you. Lord, I pray that it's not my words, but Lord, it's your word this morning. Let it be your message for your people at this time. Lord, we love you, Lord, we praise you in all things. Amen. 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 I tell you what, this morning, you know, I guess when I'm preaching and stuff and I say things and I ask for things that, you know, it's asked and you shall receive, okay? I said last week, man, I wish I had a t-shirt that said, Old Fashioned on Purpose. Well, guess what? I get here this morning and Darlene's got me a t-shirt that says, Old Fashioned on Purpose. And I, and I think that's pretty great right there. And that's me right there. That is me, Old Fashioned on Purpose. So, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, and... Yesterday, when we were out visiting and stuff, I got a phone call from Jack, and Jack brought by to my house. I didn't get to visit with him because I was out doing other stuff. Jack brought me a, a toolbox full of tools, and then, so last night I was going through this, and, and I, I was considering what illustration that I would use. You know me, I like old tools, right? Gotta love it. And so... I was looking, what illustration can I use? What, what do I have? And so I was like, we're just going to jump into God's word. And then I got to look into that box of tools. And guess what? It jumped out at us. Okay? This is a SANS tool. It's a SANS level. This is made by the SANS level and tool company. Uh, started in 1895 in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, trust me, I did a little research on it. And that he was the first to, I mean, Sands Leveling Tool Company is a major level company. They have made more levels than anybody else ever. This is what they did. The guy started off as a bricklayer, and so he had to have good tools. And so what he started was, he was the first, I believe, to have cast aluminum. Levels. Instead of wooden levels or steel levels, he wanted something a little lighter that he could work with, so it's cast aluminum in 1914. Now, you didn't find too much aluminum in 1914, but here's one right here. Uh, now, I'm not saying this is from 1914 because they moved and changed. They went from Detroit and they moved to Indiana, and this is one from Indiana, and that was after World War II came along, so this is probably World War II model or so, Jack, and you probably didn't know that, did you? But there you go. But here's the thing about this. This is, what, this is what intrigued me right there. It says, sans levels tell the truth. Interesting. Now, you've heard that old adage, okay, is he on the level? 
Are they telling the truth? Are they on the level? Well, that's where this comes from. Sans levels. It says tell the truth. I found that very interesting. It takes a level company to remind us to tell the truth, right? Truth's pretty important. The truth is pretty important. Now, for the rest of the world, no, maybe not. But you think about it. Truth is very, very important. Truth is important to our lives. As Christians, truth ought to be paramount in our lives. And so as Paul begins to tell us in Ephesians chapter 4, he begins to tell us about truth. He begins to tell us, since you've got this new man, you've put away the old man, you've gotten rid of that old sewer life, you've gotten rid of the nasty filth, the funk, that you were living in, that you were once about, you have this new man. Well, that new man's got some new characteristics. That new man has got some things that are going on. So as we look in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 through 27, let's read God's word. And God's word says this. It says, Since you put away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. 26 says, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, and don't give the devil an opportunity. Truth is pretty important. Think about this. It says, since you put away lying, speak the truth. You see, lying is part of that old man. Lying is part of that sewer life. Lying is part of that, that nastiness and that filth that we were once in. Lying. But you think about it. You you get to look at what is lying? Oh, you know, we, we have all these little things, these, these little white lies that we tell, all these little things that, that happen. Oh, well, you know, well, we, well, sometimes we try to lie to make ourselves look better, right? We lie to, to do things that, that oh, okay, it, it's all right. Well, everybody else is doing it. We lie, we cheat. We do this stuff. And so we got to looking at, at, at some things. I got to looking at, at our world. I even got to looking at what Christians really have to say about lying. What do you think about this? Lying. So I looked up a survey about lying. What do people think about lying? What, what kind of moral issue does lying have to do? Well, yeah. Says that 91% of those who were polled, those who took part in the survey, 91% lie on a regular basis. 91% lie on a regular basis. Hmm. What do you think about that? That's 91%. Well, 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 what if they only they only did you know just a no? 91%. This is like 20,000 people that they surveyed. 91%. Okay? Said 98% said that they, the reason they lied was not to offend people. 98% of people lie not to offend people. Well, I don't want to be offensive. Well, this guy's just like this. When your wife asks, does this shirt or does this dress make me look fat? No, baby, it doesn't make you look anything like that. Well, how do you like the new haircut? Things like that. Guys, ladies, Oh, 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 what does this look like? You know, we ask our men, we ask our wives, well, what does this look like? Well, how about this? Well, how, how do you like the car? Is it nice and clean? Or how, how, do you, how do you like what I did here? Oh, yes, that was wonderful. It was great. It was... The lady's like, well, I could have done a little bit better than that. <laughs> That's what we're thinking. And so we lie, and, and we're trying not to offend somebody. Or we see somebody, well, how do you like my new shirt? How do you like my new shoes? How do you like this? How do you like that? And, and we'll lie, just not to offend somebody. But you know what? That's still a lie, isn't it? That's still not truth. And we, we have a, a constant thing that we do that. And so I got to look a little bit more at it. And so, got to look at, and, and so I looked at another survey, and it was 20,000 junior high and high school students that they surveyed. It said 92%. Admitting to lying to their parents. 
73% lied to him on a weekly basis. Well, hang on. If we survey adults, and there's 91% of them are lying, and 98% lie because they want to offend somebody, and then we survey kids, junior high and high school kids, 20,000 of them, and 92% of them say, yeah, I lie. And then 73% of those sit there and say, yeah, I lie to my parents on a regular basis. You see the spiral here, church? See, lies. You see, Satan began with a lie. He lied to Adam. He lied to Eve. He just took the truth and twisted it. Well, guess what? No, there's no such thing as half-truths, is there, church? The half-truth is a lie. There's no such thing. And so we go throughout our day, we go throughout our weeks, we go throughout everything, and we, we tell these little white, white lies. And there's no such thing as a white lie. A lie's a lie. It's a sin. But we do all these things. Well, you know, we, we, we'll, students will sit there and, and cheat on tests. Well, everybody else is doing it. Oh, the adults won't we'll, we'll cheat on our taxes. Well, you know, everybody else is doing it. Oh, I'm just going to fudge a little bit. I'm just going to do it. Yeah, it's tax season. Okay? We'll do this. Just to get by, just to, it's still a lie. It's still a lie. And you know what? We're all guilty. But Paul here is saying this. He says, since you've put away lying, the part of the new man is to have a new life. You're not part of that anymore. It's thrown away. It's tossed to the side. That's what that means. To put away it means to toss to, to the side, to disassociate yourself from it. It is no longer part of who you are. Since you've put it away, since you've put away lying, since you've put away not telling the truth, those things that, that you sit there and say that, that, oh, okay, well, it makes me look just a little bit better, or we, we want to expound on something that we're telling, and it's not exactly the right thing, or sometimes it's even... The omission of somebody says something and you don't say anything because it makes you look good. Well, I'm not going to say anything that, that, that's wrong, but I'm not going to say anything that's going to say, no, that's, that's a falsehood. Hang on, no, that's not true about it. We do that. And so we lie. Listen, church, that's part of the old. That's part of the old that's part of not who we should be as Christians. Put away line. Put it away. Put it to the side. Disassociate yourself from it. Because here's what happens. When we don't, we're picking up those nasty dirty words. Every time we tell a lie. Every time we sit there and try to expound and make it look better. Make it look better. Make it, oh, I'm going to make myself look in a good light. You know what? You're putting on that dirty nasty sewer shirt. You stink. I stink. That's not what God wants for us. Listen, He's got a new set of clothes for us. We've got a new man to put on. And so Paul is sitting, sitting there saying, since you've put away lying, since you've done away with it, let's do this. He tells us what to do. It's really easy. He says, speak the truth. Now, here's the thing. Paul doesn't say, hey, you know what? Since you put away like you might want to do this. You, I, I kind of sort of suggest, it's not a suggestion, church. It says, speak the truth. That's a command. This is something that you need to do. And that word there it isn't just, okay, okay, you need to speak. Okay, that word speak there is laleo. And it's the manner in which you speak. It's the subject in what you're speaking about. It's not just speaking to speak. To, it's not. If you go back and you look at it, at the beginning of that word, the, the origin of it was like little birds chirping or children just chattering. But it got to be where it was talking about serious things. That word speak there is serious talk. It's down to the nitty gritty. It's something that you, okay, we're past the chitter chatter. Now we're on to something that's serious. And so it says speak. 
It's not just, oh, hey, we're just going to talk casually. It's, okay, I'm serious about what I'm talking about. Let's get past all the chitty chat stuff, and let's go and talk serious. And it says, speak the truth. The manner in which your speech should be, should be truth, church. Since you put away lying, since you put away all these little things, these little white lies, all these things that make you look good, the manner of things that you're speaking about should be true. The things that we speak about, the things that we talk about, the things that we sit there and talk about to people all day long, every day, the things that we should be talking about should be true. And that word truth there is this. It means to be revealed, not hidden. Not concealed. And the only thing that's not hidden and not concealed like we've been talking about is Jesus. Because the world wants to hide everything they got. Oh, they want to conceal it. That's what a lie is. Oh, I want to conceal the truth, right? That's what a lie is. I don't want the truth out. I want to conceal it. I want to put it away. I want to hide it behind my back. I don't want anybody to see it. But see, the truth is this. It's Jesus, because he is the only thing that is revealed. He is the only thing that is out in the open. He is the one that sheds light on the lives of his world. He is the only thing that sheds light. And here's the thing. That's what we need to be speaking. So when your manner of speaking, when you get down to the nitty-gritty, when you need to speak seriously, speak the truth. Why? Because the truth is... Jesus. So when we get to talking to folks, you know what? All that lying is put away. Speak truth into people's lives. Speak Jesus. And he's talking about this. He says this. He says that speak the truth each to his neighbor. Well, that word neighbor there is this. It's one who is in close proximity to one another. And we think about that. The people that are next to us, the people that live next to us, across the road, down the way, we think, okay, well, that's my neighbor. Guess what? People sitting next to you, they're your neighbor too. Well, see, within close proximity to one another. Church, he's talking about us. He's talking about church folks. He's talking about the people that you live each and every day. He's talking about the people that you live life with. He's saying, speak truth to them. Speak Jesus in their life. Tell them the truth. Why? Because the line's been put away. Truth is what we ought to be speaking. Our manner of speech ought to be true to one another. Why? Because we're all part of one another. That's what Ephesians tells us. We've been going through that. We're all connected. We're all part put together. Right? We're all one because that's what it says. Look at it. It says, because we are members of one another. It says, we're limbs. We're those joints. We're those connections that we have with one another. We're all connected. We're all part of one another. Why in the world would you want to lie to yourself? Think about it. But that's what we do. That's what the world does. The world lies to itself. Why to cover the truth? Oh, because they know the truth, and they're like, oh, no, I don't want the truth. I want to sit there and have this lie. I want to sit there and waller in it. I want to sit there and, and feed that lie. Because here's the thing. What, what happens with lies, you tell one little lie, guess what? You've got to tell another one, right? To be able to cover that one up. Oh, but it's not revealed, is it? It's a cover. But speaking the truth. Each one to his neighbor. The one that you're closely connected to. When we're talking about building up the church of God, building up the sanctuary of God, it's the ones that you are jointed to. It's the ones that you're supporting. It's the ones that you're helping to hold up. That's what it's talking about. Speak the truth to one another. Why? So that we can't go back to that old self. So that we're not picking up those dirty, nasty, filthy clothes. So we're not Going back to the old man. Why? Because Jesus has given us a new man. A new mind. <clears throat> See, he's changed our mind. He's changed our way of thinking. We don't want to go back. We want to continue with the life that he's given us. <clears throat> that is what we are supposed to be about, church. We're supposed to be about the truth. 
Well, here's the funny thing. When I was reading all those surveys and stuff, they came across a question. What about this? Well, what about, okay, that's just heathen people. That's people out in the world. That's people that, that, that don't know Jesus. Guess what, church? When they asked the question, it was this. Well, what about people who are morally good, morally right, and go to church? And you know what? The survey didn't matter. It didn't differ because they surveyed them too. So it's just not a thing of the world, church. It's in the in amongst us. It's in our church. It's in our daily lives. And we need to get rid of it. The lie needs to go. The truth needs to be preserved. <clears throat> truth is paramount. Even a love. I have to remind myself. I tell the truth. I tell the truth. Don't lie to one. Don't lie to the world. Don't lie to yourself. Make sure that the truth is being told in your life. The next verse goes into this. The next verse says... Be angry and do not sin. You're like, okay, I can do that. I can be angry. Not really. We get angry all the time, don't we? We get upset about things. The world gets upset about things. Anger is a whole lot of everything. It, oh, there's lots of things that we can get mad about. There's lots of things that we can be angry about. The injustices in the world, the, thing, the way people treat us, the things that people say, the way people offend us. Oh, we can be angry about those things, right? You see, that word anger there is like this. It's like a kindled fire. Something that, that is, it starts and is kindled and it continues to grow. It, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and, and it turns into something that, that can't be squelched. That's that word there, that word for anger. But you know what? Anger is very dangerous. You see, our world is, is really good about being angry, right? You, you can look at the news, you can look at the papers, you can read the internet, you can do all these things, and you can see what the world is angry about. Oh, the, ang the world is angry about, about the treatment of sea turtles. The world is angry about climate change. Oh, the world is angry about their politicians and all the things that's going on. Here's the thing, church. The world can get angry, but the world's not angry about the right things. When Paul's telling us to say, hey, be angry, but don't sin, here's the thing. The world's angry about little stupid stuff. Paul's telling us to be angry about sin. You see, the world can be angry over turtles, but they're not angry about children who are unborn being murdered. They can be angry about being offended by some speech that somebody else tells them, but they cannot be angry about women and children being trafficked for the pleasure of somebody else. You see, I'm getting angry right now. But here's the difference. The difference is I'm not angry at stupid little things. I'm angry at sin that's in the world. Amen. That's the difference. We can be angry, but be angry at sin. But here's the tick. Here's the thing. Be angry at the sin that's in your life. First. You see, that's what the world doesn't get. That's what the world doesn't understand. Oh, they want to be angry about all these little offenses, all these little things that are all over the world. And we want to be angry over things too. We want to be angry over the sin in other people's lives. But here's the thing. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus gives us, excuse me, chapter 7, Jesus tells us this. He tells us this. 
Chapter 7, verse 3 says this. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log in your own? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and look, there's a log in your own? Hypocrites. First, take the log out of your eye, then you will clearly see the speck that's in your brother's eye. Listen, we've got things in our lives that we need to get out first before we can be angry at stuff in other people's lives. We want to sit there and blast the whole world. We want to blast everybody else. But you know what? There's things that we need to be angry in our lives. The sin that's in our lives first. Paul's telling us, be angry, but don't sin. Hmm. You see, that word sin is there is to miss the mark. He's saying, be angry, but hit the mark. Be angry, but hit the mark. Don't sin. So you can be angry. That's fine. Righteous angry is o anger is okay. God in his wrath is angry, and that's okay. Dude. But here's the thing. God knows all things and sees all things, and he knows what's in here. We don't always get to see that. Except what he reveals to us. We can be angry over things. We can be angry over the sin of this world. But first we have to look at our sin. Church, we don't do that. I don't look at the sin in my life and I'm not angry over the sin in my life. But I should be. The things that I fail in, the things that I don't hit the mark in. Because God has set a standard and it's a level. You know what? I'm way out of plumb. I'm way out of plumb. I should be angry over my sin. This in my life. Before I go out and look at others and say, hey, you need to get this out of your life. These are the things. First, deal with the in your life. Be angry over the sin in your life. And once you've dealt with those things, then you can move on and help your brother. And here's the thing it's a help. It's a help. Be angry and don't sin. Don't sin. See, he also tells us to be angry and don't sin. And then he also tells us to do this. He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. You're like, okay, well, hey, I... he's telling you, listen, deal with it. You can be angry. You can have righteous anger. Don't sin, but also learn how to deal with it. See, that's that word anger. See, here's the thing. Anger is a very dangerous thing because if we let it kindle, we let it get to roaring, we let it get to raging, and then it, it just explodes and then it gets nasty and it gets... See, that's what the world does. The world just lets it get nasty. The world just lets it get anger and build and kindle up and just roar. And it just gets everywhere. But God's word tells us to don't let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with things. You see, in Galatians chapter 5, you start looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And there's this one in there called self-control. As you begin to walk and talk and begin to have that relationship with God in this new man, this new self, these new clothes, you begin to grow and you begin to, to mature and you, you gain all these things. Well, self-control is one of those things. Guess what? Having self-control and anger is not letting the sun go down. Because you are being spirit-led. And to say, you know what? I can deal with this anger. I can control this anger through the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. That's what it's saying. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with what's going on in your life. Deal with the things that are just being kindled up. And you know what? Let the Spirit just push. put it out. Let Him help you deal with the things that you're getting passionate and angry. And don't let them be kindled. Don't let them get into a roaring, raging fire. 
Be angry. Don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Have some self-control led by the Spirit on your anger. It's part of the new man. It's part of the new self. The world doesn't want to do that. The world wants to sit there and just have this anger and this fire and just let it sit there and just roar and rage against everybody. That's totally different from what God calls us to do. See, I've seen a lot of angry Christians. I've seen a lot of angry, angry. But here's the problem. They haven't dealt with anger in their life. They want to look at, at other people and be angry. They want to look at others and be angry. Right? That's not what Jesus tells us. He tells us to deal with the wall that we have, that beam, that post that is in our eye. Then we can help our brother. Then we can help our sister. And here's the thing. If we've got issues with one another, don't be angry at one another. Don't be angry and, and have that kindled and don't be, let the sun... Listen, let the Holy Spirit have discussions with God. God, how can I deal with this anger? I, I, I've got this, these things that, are, that I've got stirred up. I've got things that are kindled up. Help me to be able to get rid of them. Help me to be able to deal with them. Help me to be able to go to those people that I'm mad and upset with and angry at and say, you know what? Let the Holy Spirit... It's a whole lot easier to go and talk to somebody sometimes about what you're angry about, what's going on, than it is to just sit there and constantly be mad. To be fired up about it. A whole lot easier. And you know what? You'll sleep better at night. Why? Because you haven't let the sun go down. What else does it say? It says in verse 27, Says it, and don't give the devil an opportunity. And that word opportunity there is topos. It's where we get the word like topographical maps. It's that same same root word. All it is is a place. It's a place on the map. It's a place. If you go back and look at it, truthfully, some of your versions may say foothold. Okay? Think about this. There's been lots of fortresses that have been overtaken because the walls have not been shored up, because the thing, there's chunks and chinks in the walls, and there's little footholds, there's little handholds for the enemy to climb up. And when we're mad, and we're angry about the wrong things in life, and when we're angry and sin, and we continue to let our sin just grow, and we don't take God's advice and deal with it through His Spirit, we give the enemy foothold into our life. We give him a place to be able to push up, a place to grab a hold and climb the fortress. into our life. See, we're not to give him an opportunity. You see, because Satan isn't, he's an opportunist. He's just waiting. He's waiting for us. Oh, he's good at that. He's watching, waiting. Oh, here's something. I know they're going to get upset about it. Here's something that they're just, oh, it just grinds their gears. Here we go. I know exactly. <laughs> to get them. He'll wait for that opportunity. Oh, there we go. They're mad. They can't get it. They're mad. They're upset. They can't get past that. Here we go. There's my hole. There's where I can stick my hand in to begin to climb up. Oh, here we go. I found another one. I found another one. He climbs up. And you know what? Before you know it, we have given him the perfect opportunity get into our lives and to mess up our walk and our talk with Jesus. And you know what? 
when we give him an opportunity, then we cannot be doing the things that God has called us to do. Without <coughs> we're not being useful. When we give Satan an opportunity, when we give Satan, the devil, an opportunity to put his handholds in our life and climb up and, you know what? That's our fault. That's our fault. Why? Because we picked up those old clothes. We put them on back. back on. We drug them up. Listen, they're supposed to be away from us. We're supposed to have disassociated ourselves from from them. We're supposed to have laid it all aside and gone on. But you know what? We have this tendency to just kind of drag them with us, don't we? Drag them with us. We want to dig that up. Church, we've been created new. We are a new man and walking a new walk in a new life. We've had a change of mind and it should change our life. So we should be putting away lies. And that anger that's so easily kindled up, you know what? It's an anger about the wrong things. Put that away. Disassociate yourself from that. Be angry, but have righteousness. Deal with the, the sin that's in your own life first. Be angry about that. And help your brothers. Help your sisters. Let the Spirit have, help you with self-control over that anger. Walk away from it. Put it down. Let Him just pour that soothing water. Quench that fire. And guess what? That's not going to give Satan an opportunity. <coughs> a foothold. To climb off into your fortress. To climb off into your life. Walk new. Walk fresh. Walk clean every single day. As they come from the vacation this morning, church, are you on the left? Are you telling the truth? Do you constantly pick up those old nasty clothes of lying and put those things on? Are you putting on the shirt, the pants, the shoes of anger over things that don't matter? Over things that have no eternal significance? Or do you have rights over sin? Are you angry over the sin in your life so that you can deal with that? Before you deal with the sin that's out in the world? Are you self controlled in that anger? Or are you giving the devil an opportunity to climb off into your life? That's my question for you, church. Have you dealt with the things that are in your life so that you can walk in this new man? To clean them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, I just want to thank you. Lord, I just praise you for the day that you've given to us. Lord, just thank you for letting us be able to look into your word and to be able to see you. And Lord, just thank you for letting us be able to see how we are supposed to be for the example that has been given to us, Lord. Lord, because you know what? I know in my life I'm not where I need to be. But Lord, I've got a goal. Lord, we all have a goal if we belong to you. To be more and more like your son each and every day. Lord, help us to put away mine. Help us to disassociate ourselves from that. Lord, help us to put away anger. But Lord, help us to be angry about it. 
Help us to feel it over sin. <clears throat> more, more importantly, help us to be angry over the sins of our life. And Lord, help us to be able to deal with it through the work of your spirit in our lives. Lord, I pray that this morning, if there's anybody that needs to deal with the things that are in their life, Lord, that they'll deal with them today. Lord, the things that they've been lying to themselves about. Lord, the things that they've been angry about. Lord, help them to be able to give those things to you and walk away. And Lord, help us to always treat you. And help us to always speak your spirit into the lives of those who are hurt. Lord, help us to be angry about the lack of things. Lord, we love you. We praise you in all things.